Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Katz Building and Penn State Law and the Penn State School of International Affairs. We're delighted that you're all here and that you've chosen to brave the elements out there, which got kind of crazy there for a few minutes. So thank you all for coming. We have a wonderful speaker tonight. Uh, very pleased to introduce and welcome Stephen Lee Myers, who's a Washington correspondent of the New York Times. Incredibly, uh, among the things he reports on are Hillary Clinton's emails from the time when she was Secretary of State, as well as Russia, and the increasing interest in the other presidential candidate, Donald Trump's connection to Russia. Uh, both of these things are within his area of expertise. Uh, he's also the author of a new book called The New Czar, The Rise and Reign of Vladimir Putin. So at this time, I would like to introduce Professor Catherine Rogers. Professor Rogers is the Paul and Marjorie Rice faculty scholar here at Penn State Law. She's also an affiliate faculty member of our School of International Affairs. And Catherine will now give a more detailed introduction of Steve Myers, as well as our moderator tonight, Dr. Scott Gardner. Thank you again and welcome. Great. Well, let me thank you again for all being here. I couldn't be more delighted to introduce uh, Stephen Scott Myers, who for 27 years has been a correspondent uh, with the New York Times, which I think means he started when he was about 12. Um, seven of those years were spent in Moscow, many of them with his family there with them, uh, and several also as bureau chief there. Uh, he is now, as mentioned, back in DC, uh, where he focuses on foreign policy and national security. All of that means that uh, he has uh, read all of Putin's speeches, so we don't have to, uh, and all of Hillary Clinton's emails, uh, so we don't have to. Uh, and until recently, these two tasks were considered completely unrelated. Um, but as we all know, recently, uh, they have sort of converged in uh, the chaos of the current election, uh, as the uh, intelligence community has been increasingly convinced uh, that the Russian government is, in fact, uh, behind the hack of the DNC emails, which then, of course, uh, turns up uh, intensity on all email security uh, and eventually back to questions, I guess, about Hillary's emails. Um, these worlds have converged, um, but as we know, we always need someone intelligent and thoughtful to tell the story of them. Uh, which is what Steve does. Um, the, what we organized tonight, uh, we thought would be much more interesting than just having inviting Steve to come up and uh, give a speech, uh, is to present this as a dialogue, as an interactive interview format. And we're incredibly fortunate to have here, uh, as the director of our School of International Affairs, uh, Professor Scott uh, Sigmund Gardner, who is himself a scholar of foreign affairs, conflict mediation, and empirical studies of uh, war. Uh, he is, as I said, the director of our School of International Affairs, and he is actually uh, also particularly uh, adept for this uh, job because he is a frequent op-ed contributor uh, to uh, newspapers uh, and so is used to bringing these issues, in a sense, to mainstream media. Um, the, uh, so with that, I, I'm going to end the introductions because it's not, uh, I think I'd like to have them talk. I do have a few mundane housekeeping matters. I'm told that uh, uh, truly mundane, but uh, nevertheless important to potentially some of you during the talk, uh, the bathrooms are located outside and to the right. Um, afterwards, we will be having a, uh, a book signing. So as you exit the doors, you will see the books will be for sale. And uh, Steve has agreed to stay as long as we need him to, to sign all the books. Uh, I am personally, actually, that's my copy down there, the hard copy. Uh, last time I saw him signing books, I will say there was an incredibly long line. And I think they sold out. So get there quickly if you actually want to get a book. Um, we're going to proceed um, with 45 minutes of this interview uh, session, uh, and then 45 minutes of questions and answers from you. So we hope that you will come and be part of this discussion. We have two microphones here. Please come up. 
I will um, ask that you please make questions uh, as opposed to speeches or dialogues uh, and try and keep them relatively short. I should also add that we are being live webcast. There was so much interest in the program that we're live webcasting it and that it will also be recorded and available afterwards on the Penn State School of International Affairs website and law school websites. So with that, no further ado, let me ask and invite Steve and Scott to come up to the stage. Good evening. It's uh, good to see you all and to, to be here. And I'm uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to uh, discuss with you uh, Steve Myers, who's recently wrote a book, The New Czar, on Vladimir Putin. Um, we're going to start out by talking about uh, Putin and his book. Um, and then maybe we'll uh, go on to some other topics. Uh, Steve was Moscow bureau chief, has one of the senior New York Times correspondents in national security. Uh, was embedded with a unit in Iraq during the invasion. So he has lots and lots of, of experience and knowledge to share. But let's start with Putin. And um, Vladimir Putin, Steve, was uh, recently voted by, or I don't know if voted is the right word, uh, identified by Forbes and Time magazine as the most influential person in the world. Um, and for Forbes, I think it's like three years in a row. And Time magazine said something like over the decade or something. Like so. Putin, they're putting up there as either among or the very top most influential people. And you've written a fabulous book on it. I very much enjoyed uh, reading in tremendous detail about Vladimir Putin, his life, and his politics. What surprised you uh, as you wrote the book, having been uh, involved with Putin for over 16 years? You knew a lot about it, but what surprised you as you organized him uh, into a book format and, and researched him even more in depth? Like, um. That's a great question. I'll, I'll first say thank you uh, for having me here. It's, it's great to be here to talk about this. Um, what surprised me most, um, the remarkable thing about Vladimir Putin, I, I say this somewhat jokingly, is that he always wins. And, um, and that drives people crazy. Uh, it's driven now two administrations crazy, three really if you count uh, Bill Clinton's. Um, it's driven his uh, opponents in, inside Russia crazy. Um, he has an, a remarkable ability, uh, I think, to have adapted um, to leadership uh, that he was not prepared for. And, you know, I, I arrived in, in Moscow in, in 2002 when I was based there for the Times. Um, he was already in power about a year and a half by the time I got there. Um, and, you know, so going back to the Yeltsin years, um, when Putin emerged from nothing, really, to become the leader of the country uh, is a remarkable story. And, and it's, it's almost unbelievable. And it is for his opponents. And so from that, there have been a lot of, you know, theories, conspiracy theories. People talk about, you know, uh, providential intervention in some respects. An act of God brought this guy to power or an act of the KGB. And, and, and so I, it, it was the, the, the resilience that he's shown and adapted over, over time in office um, to the point uh, where, uh, where we are today that I think has been probably the most surprising thing. When, when he came to power, uh, Yeltsin, democracy, Russia had a, an optimism with it and an excitement uh, with it. Did, did Yeltsin screw up? I mean, should it have been obvious to Yeltsin that this person was, and, and, his, and Yeltsin's supporters, that this person was not going to be the, uh, the individual to take Russia to the next level of democratic openness, but rather to revert back to a, a more dictatorial perspective? Was that obvious, do you think, at the time? Or did they mess up? Uh, no, it wasn't obvious at the time, actually, and maybe that's also surprising to some here. The, and this is a good point to step back, is that the Soviet Union fell apart in, um, in the late 80s, 91 officially. Um, Vladimir Putin at the time was a KGB officer in East Germany, um, a, a loyal servant of, of the Soviet state, uh, doing what he believed to be the right thing, uh, you know, uh, defending Soviet values. Um, he, he wasn't a particularly ardent communist at any point in his life, um, but he believed in the state that he served. Uh, and then it all came undone. And, uh, and that left um, the, the perception of that inside Russia 
um, versus outside of Russia is actually quite strikingly different. And Putin very much represented the, the class of people who were left adrift in some respects uh, by the collapse of the Soviet Union. We all celebrated it as, I say we all here in the United States and in Western Europe, as, as the end of, of uh, a Cold War ideological standoff. That um, was quite unnerving at times. Um, and in Russia, it was actually, there, there was a great burst of optimism um, uh, that you alluded to, um, but it was also a period of great tumult and, and uh, tragedy in a lot of ways and hardship. And, and Putin personally experienced that, partly when he came back uh, to the Soviet Union uh, from East Germany after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, he came back, he had very few job prospects. Um, there were, you know, there were a lot of former KGB agents around the world, if you can imagine, who were coming back, uh, as well as Soviet troops who had been based in Eastern Europe. And this is a, a, effectively a humiliating retreat for them to come back to the new, now independent Russia. Uh, but Putin signed up with one of the democratic leaders uh, of the time, uh, an ally of Boris Yeltsin, uh, Anatoly Sobchak, who was the governor of of St. Petersburg, the former Leningrad, um, and was, you know, a man who was talked about as a possible future president. Um, and, and Putin hitched his wagon to one of the new Democrats of Russia. Um, but it was at a time of great, uh, great tumult, great uncertainty. Um, and, uh, and in the early experiences Putin himself had with democracy, um, it, it was, uh, to see his boss, the guy he worked for, he served very loyally and capably. Um, he, he lost his election in 1996. And so Putin's experience with doc democracy was like many Russians, which was kind of disappointing. It wasn't a, a wholehearted embrace um, the way uh, that we would have uh, imagined it, I think. And I, I think we sometimes overestimated um, the, the Russian embrace of democracy. Um, and I say that thinking, I believe Yeltsin, Sobchak, people like, like them, they were true Democrats. They really did envision Russia taking a democratic course. By the end of Yeltsin's period, um, uh, he, I think, had already um, undermined some of that progress. And um, when he selected Putin, it was at a time when he went through a number of, uh, of potential successors. If you remember this period in the late 90s, you know, he was, he was firing prime ministers every few months. Uh, I think they went through five in a period of about 16 months. There was a financial crisis. They, they defaulted on much of their debt. Um, the economy collapsed. Uh, there was, it was a feeling that Russia was a, almost a failed state. Um, and Yeltsin was looking for somebody, uh, not so much to preserve the democratic experience, but I think to preserve the, the country to hold it together. And he was looking for somebody, as he said, with a military demeanor. Um, and, he, and he went through a couple generals uh, searching for his uh, potential successor and settled on, in fact, a, a KGB colonel. So um, does, did, uh, did he anticipate that that would take the country on an authoritarian course? No, I don't think he did. Um, and some people, uh, I, I did not get a chance to ask Yeltsin this because he died. Uh, but the um, but people close to him have said it was one of his big regrets. Talking about that, you write, you know, about the, uh, talking about the chaos that uh, that was uh, uh, starting to unravel in that transition period from Yeltsin to Putin. You wrote that uh, for Putin, there's a dark association between democracy and radi radicalism, elections and chaos. I mean, throughout the book, it seems that there's a that Putin's really driven by a fear of political messiness, that he, he doesn't like that, he doesn't like chaos, he likes things organized, kind of working properly in his notion of what working properly means. I mean, is that, is that the ideology of Putin? Because it doesn't seem that there's really a political ideology other than keep the state together, which is consistent with what Yeltsin wanted. So what, what motivates him? Uh, that's an excellent question, and the, uh, it's true that throughout his experience, uh, his, his political life, if you will, um, the thing that he seems to fear the most, um, to put it simply, even crudely, is mob rule. 
And the, um, one of the first experiences he had was when he was still in East Germany. Um, and the Berlin Wall came down. You all remember this. Some of you maybe are not old enough to remember. But those of us who are old enough to remember, it was this euphoric moment in, in Germany when finally the, the dreaded East German uh, state more or less collapsed on itself. And this dividing wall of Europe, which was both literal and symbolic, came down. And um, in Dresden, uh, the town where uh, Putin served in the KGB for five years, um, there was a, a mass protest a f couple months, well, six weeks after the, the, the wall came down, when they, uh, the protesters in Dresden descended on the Stasi headquarters, the Stasi being the secret police of East Germany, which were even more dreaded than, than the KGB was in the Soviet Union. Uh, really nasty guys, uh, total control um, uh, over society, uh, and sowed a lot of... Um, suspicion inside the society, which was very um, uh, uh, insidious. You know, it, it really gnawed away at society. So it was a deeply reviled group. Putin loved these guys. These were his colleagues uh, that he worked with for so many years. And this massive crowd descended on the Stasi headquarters in Dresden, which was right around the corner where he had both lived and worked um, for the years that he was there. And, uh, and, and when he described the scene, um, it was not of a crowd sort of asserting their right to be free. It was of a deranged mob. He even talked about wild-eyed people screaming, you know, all kinds of insanity. Um, and there was this famous incident where they, they came to the KGB villa. And, um, you know, some of the stories both that he's told and others have reported out of it uh, made it sound like this really dangerous confrontation. And I happened to meet somebody who was there that night and, and described to me what happened. And, and it, was, it was a moment where Putin had to sort of stand up to what in his mind was this deranged crowd of people um, uh, ready to, you know, uh, thirsty for blood, basically. And uh, in fact, the, the, one of the guys who was in the crowd described it as, in fact, a kind of almost jubilant experience. Um, they were all so happy, and, and yet Putin saw it as this kind of chaos descending. And, and I thought about that. I mentioned already his uh, experience in, in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, when the, uh, his boss, a guy he really almost considered a father figure, uh, stood for election um, as governor, which is what you do in democratic uh, uh, countries. But one of, another one of his aides, one of Putin's uh, fellow deputy mayors, challenged the boss, challenged the governor um, to uh, to re-election. And you know, again, that's what you do in a democracy, right? Um, and, uh, but Putin considered it an, an ultimate betrayal. He called the man a Judas, you know, in public. Um, and, uh, and, and he lost, you know, the governor. Uh, and, and Putin couldn't, I think, appreciate, like, how could this have happened? How could such an honorable guy, you know, who's the man in charge, lose to the capricious will of the people. Um, and you saw from the moment that he was appointed prime minister in, in, in 1999, um, and then essentially appointed acting president, before he'd ever stood for election, by the way, um, uh, that, by, that in his first instinct was to control the electoral process. Um, and he talks um, often in, in uh, several encounters he's had over the years of an early experience with the regional election in the Caucasus near Chechnya uh, in this one region where, you know, they had an election which was essentially a tie between two different ethnic groups and, and in his mind, you know, the outcome of that was almost certainly going to be civil war. So the only way to avoid civil war is basically to annul the election results or at least manage them so that, um, so that there isn't chaos um, and you see this over and over in his experiences um, when, when there are protests of, of the fraudulent elections in 2011 and the parliamentary um, races, you know, that people come out on the street. And in his mind, this is that mob again uh, assembling outside his door. The, the hardest part for me to understand as I read the book was this notion of managed democracy, that there are semblances of a democratic order, there's courts, there's processes that are going about, there's elections, 
And I couldn't, it's hard for me to understand in modern day Russia, is it completely fake, like the Nazis, you know, blowing up the train track in Poland as a justification to, to invade, and you don't understand why it's so convoluted that way, but that's kind of what they do. But it, it doesn't seem to be completely fake. There seem to be some semblances of real institutional dynamics going on, but it's clearly not the notion of institutions as we know it. It's managed, it's contrived. Some of it is fake. And so where that line is, that kind of gray area between real democracy and fake democracy, real institutions and fake institutions, and how he's driving that is hard for me to get a handle on. I think that in the, um, you know, again, take, take the long view for a minute. In, this, in, in the Soviet Union, there were kind of elections. And then in perestroika um, under Gorbachev, there, there was definitely an effort to try to create more of an interactive um, experience between the ruled and the, and, and the rulers, I think. It wasn't democracy by any means. But then after the collapse of the Soviet Union under Yeltsin, who I believe actually was a true Democrat, really wanted to create what we would call a, a Western-styled democracy. And they created the institutions. Um, they, uh, they created you know, an election commission. They, they had elections. Um, some people would dispute this, but even Putin's first presidential election in 2000 um, was, was, I think, reasonably fair. They may have stuffed some ballots, um, but, the, but it wasn't you know, wholesale uh, fraud. So the, they, they sort of, there was, there was an infancy to some of the democratic institutions. You know, they, they wrote a new constitution. The constitution's actually pretty, pretty good, right? And it, it, it provides all kinds of protections for individuals, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, which is really important. Um, but um, but they, were, they didn't really mature by the time Putin came to office. And Putin, again, as we discussed, had this fear of, of, of democratic uncertainty or messiness, as you put it. And, and so that had to be controlled. Uh, and it, with each step, I remember the, uh, the elections in 2003 for the parliament were also reasonably democratic, um, but by then you could already feel some of what they would call the administrative resources being brought to bear, which is the, the, the state siding essentially with one party. Um, and and that's, that election was the one that drove out the, the, what were left of the Democrats from the 90s out of parliament. Uh, with the, the exception of like seven. Um, and then by his reelection in 2004, it was no longer a democratic process anymore, I think. And now you just have these, uh, the elections, the parliamentary elections actually in a, in a couple weeks, um, they, they're, they're almost a charade. Um, people vote, um, they, they still stuff ballots you know, like a good democracy would, right? But the, uh, but it's become, it's, it, there's no drama left to it. And if there's no drama, it's not really democratic. So, so why continue the charade? I mean, why is that so important? Because it's, if everybody knows it's fake, or does everybody know it's fake? That's one question. And two, if most people know it's fake, why, why bother to continue it? Um, this, this may not be one of the most surprising things about Putin, but I, I, would, I would say it's probably one of the most important things for, for everybody to understand about him. He could have, with the snap of a finger, um, changed the Constitution in 2008 so that he didn't have to leave office. Um, and he didn't do that. And a lot of people were essentially begging him to. I mean, the equivalent of our state legislatures were appealing formally um, uh, passing resolutions uh, calling on the federal government to uh, change the Constitution to allow the president to serve as many terms as he would like. Um, and, and Putin always said no to that. And the reason, I think, is because he craves international legitimacy. And there still is, I think, in the world today, and this may be changing, um, a, a notion that you gain some legitimacy as a leader from elections. I mean, Bashar al-Assad has elections. Um, Saddam Hussein had elections. And, and to the degree that you can have a credible electoral process, I think that that increases your, your credibility uh, overseas. 
Uh, and I think that was very important to him. And so when his time came to um, end his second term in 2008, he stepped aside. And I think that that was one of the most important moments um, in, in Russian history, I think, of this century, because he could have stepped aside. Um, and at the, it, I, this is when I first thought about doing a book about Putin. And the reason I didn't is because I didn't know if he was going to really leave. And uh, if he had left, I think he could even today be considered in a totally different light as a sort of George Washington figure of the new Russia. But in 2012, he decided for a lot of reasons uh, that after having ceded the job to one of his protégés, Dmitry Medvedev, that he needed to come back. Um, at which point they, they have changed the Constitution now to lengthen the terms, um, but still there are two term limits. And so he's now serving his first of what will be two uh, consecutive terms, at which point he will be limited again. That's not till 2024. So he has some time to think about what to do. Um, but I think that when his decision to come back was when I think we realized that, that his trajectory was going to not be in the, I mean, it's a very different legacy than if he had just let Medvedev run again. I mean, he, he never left the scene. He was prime minister the whole time Medvedev was president. But there was a division of, of power in Russia. And, and what Russia needs is a division of power. Uh, they need to have checks and balances, even if it's in, in, an, in, in a presidential system, uh, you know, heavily presidential system. Um, but they have none now, and uh, the parliament is a joke. It's, uh, it, it's not seen as a serious check at all. So um, th th there was a real moment, and it was the day that he announced that he was going to come back as president that I exchanged notes with my agent, and we, you know, started the process that became this book. Terrific. That's, uh, I really like those two kind of decision nodes, both the opting out and then the re-opting back in is, is critical for him and for you. I think that's neat. Um, so let's broaden it out a little bit. Um, you've been talking about how there's kind of a, a two paths going along, uh, two evolutionary paths. One is Putin, and, and one are kind of the nascent democratic institutions in Russia. And they're obviously interacting back and forth together. Um, and they're evolving, and the institutions are getting weaker and weaker, and Putin's getting stronger and stronger. Um, but during this time, we see this occur in quite a few other uh, nation states. Uh, with this burst of, of optimism and, and democratic hopefulness, and then kind of a regression back to des, uh, you know, despotic, dictatorial uh, uh, perspectives. Turkey and, and Erdogan, you know, same type of thing. Turkey was looking good, things were upbeat, and then it's kind of collapsing back to a, a much more dictatorial, uh, anti-democratic uh, state. You've seen it in a lot of different countries, more or less during the same time that we've observed it with Putin. Do you think there are forces outside of Russia that are uh, pushing this evolutionary path, weakening the institutions and strengthening the strong man? You know, I think that for a quarter century now, there's, there was basically a hope that after the end of the Cold War and the, and the ideological divide um, that there would um, be, as it was famously called, an end to history, and that you would, more or less, countries would embrace this um, steady, uh, if sometimes erratic, march to a, a, a more liberal democratic uh, kind of governance. And, you know, I think the challenge, um, the challenge in, in Russia's case is, is, I think, unique to its uh, status as a former superpower, and still superpower, at least in some respects, uh, by virtue of its um, nuclear arsenal and also its veto at the UN. Um, that makes it a very unique case. But um, what I think is going on in a broader way, uh, and this might apply in our country as well, is that there, there are a lot of um, forces uh, underway that um, I don't want to blame the internet, but I, I do think that the sort of globalization of information um, uh, is creating new tensions and pressures uh, that I think some democratic systems, you see this in Europe certainly, uh, are struggling to uh, keep up with, if that's the right way to put it. And, uh, and that's very much true in Russia um, as well. 
Um, it, it seems to be the case in, in Turkey. I'm not an expert in Turkey, but I think China is under, undergoing some of this. And, and countries um, uh, are looking for ways to control um, income inequality. Uh, you know, the, the great benefit of globalization and free trade uh, has been, a, you know, the, the, the free flow of ideas as well as goods and commerce, uh, but that's also left people behind. Uh, it's devastated industries in some places, um, and some countries have done better than others in adapting to that. And so I think when you have the pressures um, from that, the, uh, those forces as well as the, you know, crises mm -hmm. in the world with terrorism, uh, with the refugee crisis and so forth, that it, it's, it's creating a lot of pressure on societies and often the instinct is to respond forcefully, you know, to look for a, you know, uh, a, a strong man who can, in, at least in, in politically, make people feel like there is a solution, there is a way to get a grip back on your country and your identity as a country and, and often that takes the form, and we see this a lot in Europe, um, I was just there last week, and you see this notion of of nationalism rising up again. And you know, not it's not just the last you know quarter century in the case of the European Union, but the last you know half century where there has been an effort, I think, to unite the continent in a way so that you didn't have the rise of nationalism because that didn't go well before. And so um, you know, there was a lot of pressure on that. I'm actually a little bit more optimistic than a lot of people that I, I, I still think that the European vision, if you will, is, is a great one. They won the Nobel Prize for a reason. Uh, and I think that they'll, there will be a little bit more resilience in European um, uh, unity uh, than, than we expect right now or than it seems. Um, but it's certainly under pressure. And I think that that's, what, that's why people are looking for somebody um, you know, who has an answer. I mean, you started by s talking about Forbes magazine. And by the way, I think these rankings are ridiculous. Um, I would have picked Angela Merkel last year, personally. But the, uh, but you know, the, how do you say one person is more influential than the other? But I think that people look to, to Putin, um, including people in this country, and say, there's a man who knows what he wants for his country, you know? But what does that mean, you know? I mean, how does that, you know, set an example for us. You know, I, I asked people in Europe, I did, again, when I was just there last week, what, what is Putinism? What is it that attracts you to Putinism? You know, in the, it, in the Soviet Union, or the, you know, in the Cold War, you know, the, there was a communist ideology, you know, and a lot of people embraced that, you know, they're, they're, it stood for something. Um, there's no ideology to Putin's Russia now. I mean, I think they're trying to come up with one, uh, which has a little bit to do with, you know, conservative values, family values, the, the role of orthodoxy in the, in the state, um, the strong state and all this, um, some of it reaching back uh, to czarist times. Um, but really there's not, you know, what does that offer, offer a Bulgarian or, you know, a Dutchman, you know? Do they want that? Uh, do they want to be an illiberal society? Um, this is again why I'm optimistic about Europe because I, I don't think that that's what people are embracing. But you see people like Matt Drudge here in this country saying, you know, Put Putin is the leader of the free world. I mean, in my mind, that's an absurdity. But, but you know, I think that there's a, a, there's a temptation to look at decisive action as being what we need in the world today. Uh, even if you might not, there might not be any reason or clearer thought behind decisive action. People want to see that because deci only decisive action will resolve our problems, which are great right now. So in terms of decisive action and opportunism, um, what does that mean for the Ukraine? Or one of my colleagues, uh, Joe DeThomas, is former U.S. ambassador to Estonia. What is that? Uh, I've taught Estonian students. They're really worried ab about uh, Russia and possible re-expansion of the Soviet empire. Do you get the sense that uh, with Putin, that there's a drive to expansion either as part of an ideology, opportunism, or kind of like with the Argentine junta and the Falklands, a way of distracting other issues that he doesn't want to address? Um, that, that's an excellent question. The, I, I, a lot of people will say, like, Putin's trying to reestablish the Soviet Union. He's not. 
Um, and and it, that's, that's just too simplistic a way to look at it. Um, what he is doing is trying to preserve what he sees as a Russian sphere of influence. Um, and, and for obvious reasons, some of that overlaps with the so former Soviet borders. Um, I think in the case of the Baltic states, and I've, I've heard the same things uh, from my friends there, they're very worried um, because they have minority Russian populations. Um, they're very close, um, obviously, to the Russian border. Um, and, you know, they were subjugated um, by the Soviet Union for <laughs> half century. And, and they are worried about that happening again. But they've also joined NATO, and I'm a big believer in the NATO alliance. So I think that offers them a measure, measure of protection. When you get to countries like Ukraine and, and Georgia, uh, which has two uh, ethnic enclaves that are now allied more closely with, with Russia, um, you know, Putin looks at what was formerly uh, Russian territory and, and still he considers territory vital to Russia's interests. I mean, Ukraine is a very special case because of the long historic, cultural, religious uh, ties between the, the cultures. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of people in Ukraine rightly say that they're an independent nation now and they deserve to make their own sovereign choices. Um, those are at odds with Russia and what Russia sees as its interest, and that's the cause of this clash right now. There's, a, I think it's the second or third largest town in uh, uh, Estonia is, what, 90% Russian or something like that. And so I think that's the fear, is that they do another partial grab like they did with the Ukraine, and then they can point to people on the ground and say, these are Russians. Why shouldn't they be a part of Russia? I think, I, I mean, there's no question that they've played that up and they've instigated inside uh, the Baltic states as well as Ukraine uh, and, and elsewhere in Moldova and even in, in parts of uh, Western and Central Europe, the, you know, the, the notion of uh, a sort of grievance of Russian-speaking minorities. Um, but the, at least when I was in the Baltics last, I, I didn't see a lot of clamoring to get out of the European Union or NATO, even by Russian Racist. speakers. Um, and, you know, I think that there are a lot of, a lot of Russians, by the way, in Russia itself, there are a lot of Russians who would love to be part of the European Union. Uh, and what was going on in Ukraine was a fight over, um, you know, what kind of economic political system would you have? And, and there were a sizable uh, chunk of the population in Ukraine that very much wants to be part of Europe. When I interact with Russians um, in Moscow, uh, I don't get this sense of they want to be different, they want to be separate. Um, almost every Russian I know vacations in Europe, many of them own property there. Um, they have bank accounts there. You know, there's this, uh, yeah, I remember when we had an interview with Putin uh, with the New York Times, I mean, he said, Russia is a European country. And I, I believe that to be true. But, you know, the, uh, I think that there is a political fight going on uh, where Putin, uh, to answer your question, is I think, uh, seeking to maintain a, a, a zone of influence, a sphere of influence, privileged influence um, that is, in, in his mind, essential to protecting Russia. I mean, I think he thinks of Ukraine as a buffer zone from European influence. Um, and by European influence, I mean democratic values, you know, free trade, uh, open societies, and the sort of things that I think he would, in his mind, represent that dangerous democracy that is too unpredictable. They might elect somebody else. Terrific. So I, I want to move on to uh, Syria, maybe Iraq. But first, I think there's, there's one topic regarding Russia and Putin that we haven't addressed that I think is very important. And, and I want to see if you think uh, is very important. That's oil. Because uh, one of the unique aspects of Russia is it's a very big country that's very dependent on one commodity. And most of the world's countries that are so dependent as Russia is on one commodity are much smaller countries. And so that separates uh, Russia out. And so l let me just hit, hit you up with a very specific question. So do you think that the drop in oil prices uh, changed that evolutionary path for Putin, or did it just kind of speed it up? The it's a little bit more complicated than that because it's really, it was the rise of oil um, that brought Putin, or that consolidated his power, that allowed him 
to uh, achieve what he accomplished, especially in his first uh, eight years as president. Um, you know, the price had started to go up even in, in Yeltsin's time after this horrible default and the economic crisis in 98. Um, but he, no question, benefited from the, uh, the rise of oil prices uh, and used it to um, float the boat of a lot of Russians. And so um, I, I, I say this, and some of my Russian friends have, uh, have been appalled, um, but the, the living in Moscow now today has probably never been better uh, for ordinary Russians in the entire history of that country. I mean, a thousand years back. Uh, life in Moscow, even at some of the other bigger cities, um, is quite prosperous, um, not by our standards, but certainly by Russian standards. And there's still wrenching poverty in the country, don't get me wrong, but the, the oil uh, and energy boom of the first decade of this century really um, paid dividends, and it allowed a lot of money to be um, spread out through the economy despite the corruption, despite the, the cronyism, um, and the fact that you have a very, very consolidated wealth in a, in a handful of, of a lot of people who happen to have gone to school with Vladimir Putin. And the, um, uh, but that, that I think is, has really uh, been the foundation of his political popularity, which is genuine, I think. Um, when that goes down, and it has, um, it strains that, I think. And it's when the price went down and then our sanctions came into effect uh, after Crimea, uh, the economy really took a beating. Um, it also took a big beating in the financial crisis in 2008 and 9. And at the time, if I remember, forgive me, I, I won't have the, the prices exactly right, but oil had hit $140 a barrel, and then it was down to 50 again. And people said it'll never be 140 again, and and it didn't. But it was like 130 again. And um, from the people I've talked to around Putin on this issue, um, there's an expectation that oil will once again come up. It goes up and down. And so they just need to ride out this low trench that we're in right now. And, and already it's up a little bit. And um, it's almost to the point where they can be stable again. But, um, but it's difficult right now. And so I think they're betting wrongly that they can just wait until the, the price rises again. And of course, you know, economists who are a lot smarter than I am on this stuff will say they need to diversify their economy and all of this, and they never do any of that because it's just too easy to ride the, the price up um, when it goes up. So um, the key part, I think, in that, in Steve Meyer's very intelligent and informed answer was who you go to school with matters, <laughs> right? So, um, so um, why don't we start taking some questions now? And so I'd ask people to kind of uh, uh, come on up to the microphones. There's two microphones. They're identical. Um, I'm going to ask everybody's questions to please be brief uh, and, and uh, come back, compact. Um, as uh, Professor Rogers said, please ask a question. Do not make a statement. And uh, we're not going to have time for follow-ups. And so um, just in, or multi-part questions. You get one shot at it. Uh, so that uh, as many people as, as possible can ask questions. And then uh, we'll, we'll go along with that as long as people have questions. And if there's not a lot more people that have questions, I've got more questions. And so we're, you're not getting out easy. Uh, so if you have a question, you should ask it. Um, so if you just give your name and then uh, ask your question, please. One, one, two. Hi, my name is Camila Tulaganova. Um, Dobry den. Dobry den. Um, I have, um, I'm an engineering science and mechanics student at Penn State uh, in uh, graduate school. And I have a question for you. Um, Putin has brought these two major, I would call them weapons, to the arena. One is his army of internet trolls who will have dozens of accounts and they really have a huge impact on the social climate and the opinions, both in Russia and now we learn even in the US, because now sometimes they will plant these theories through these trolls. So that's one thing that he brought in. Uh, and we know the addresses of the buildings where these people are sitting and typing these hundreds of comments and creating these uh, emotions. And the second weapon, I would say, is the Orthodox Church, because he brought it back into Russia. He gave it legitimacy. He gave it huge power. He made laws to protect the feelings of uh, the people who believe believers. Um, and that has also put a constraint in the community and the gay rights and on what people can do and think. So how should Russians in Russia respond to those 
two major changes, and how should the, should the international community respond to those changes? Well, the first thing I learned as a journalist is never read the comments <laughs> on your stories. Um, it's a waste of time. And I shouldn't say that because we have dear readers, so if I've offended any New York Times reader who comments on my stories, I apologize. The, um, uh, the, 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 the trolling is kind of a new concept, and uh, it, it goes back to a bit of what I was saying about the, uh, the sort of the global information age we live in, um, that they can, you know, the, the Soviet Union did this, by the way, and we did too, but during the Cold War, you know, we had our information wars going on in, this, in the Soviet bloc as well, but the, um, you know, they, they want to promote their cause, they want to, and in one sense, I, I sort of think it's, it's a little over-dramatized. Um, you know, a bunch of guys, we used to joke about bloggers being guys in their pajamas, you know? It's like, so if there are a bunch of people in their pajamas writing nasty things about the U.S. election, I don't really care, you know? It's like part of the debate. And um, we should hopefully, you know, the voices of reason um, it prevail. Uh, and and I, I think I may be losing that argument a little bit because it's, it's an overwhelming amount of information. And there is, frankly, a lot of garbage on the Internet. And, uh, and not just from Russian trolls. And uh, we, we have our own trolls here. So the, um, uh, I think part of it is just to, to try to fight on the level of, of what, you know, as a journalist, I respect, which is, you know, the truth as best as we can tell. Um, I'm not that worried, frankly, about the, the trolling thing. Um, and I know a lot of people worry about it. They say, oh, Russian disinformation. But, you know, truth is powerful. And it goes back to what I was saying about sort of like, well, what is, what is Putinism, not Putin himself, but what is Putinism offering to Europeans or Americans for that matter? You know, maybe it's some sense of a strong man, um, but if it's just obfuscation, if it's just lies, about what's happening in Europe. They've been called out on a lot of the trolling they've done. There was this story of a, a three-year-old boy being crucified in Ukraine. It was absolutely fabricated. Uh, and it was shown to be fabricated quickly. I mean, it takes a few minutes to discredit some of these things. And so, you know, are there useful idiots out there who see these and read these comments and believe them? Yeah, but I also think that the smarter people are gonna win, you know, uh, that argument every time. Um, which is, you know, I mean, I have to talk about this next week, but the, um, uh, I'm trying to be a little bit more optimistic on it. The church is actually a, related to this in a way. Um, I think an actual much more powerful institution for Putin inside Russia and beyond for the Orthodox um, uh, uh, around the world, Russian Orthodox, but also the other Orthodox churches, and, and even more broadly, I think, conservative religious believers um, to represent uh, 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 there is, I think, a kind of uh, formulation there, a beginning of a, of a system of values, uh, which are related very much to the church, um, preservation, sanctity of marriage, for example, and so forth. You know, we have that debate in this country. It's a debate in Europe. Um, and there's no question, Putin didn't invent the church, by the way, uh, but he, he, he's used it, um, I think, uh, and from his own personal experiences, you know, his mother tells this story of having baptized him when he was a, uh, an infant, uh, which would have still been when Stalin was alive, which would have been a very dangerous thing to do, uh, certainly not an acceptable thing to do. Um, and yet he was in the KGB, and if he had been a, a true believer, he would not have been allowed into the KGB, because um, they barred believers from serving. And the, um, but when he came into political life, he talked about the Orthodox faith, faith as something being important to him, important to his mother, um, and that was part of his message to a broader Russian community. Um, and, and it's been very powerful. You mentioned the gay rights issue. Um, there was the, you know, the girl b punk band, Pussy Riot, uh, who, who challenged this relationship between the church and state, which goes back not just to Putin, but centuries uh, to Tsarist times. Um, of being an essential component of state. Um, but the, uh, I'll go back to the Russian constitution, and I know that Putin knows this. Uh, there are other recognized religions in Russia, including Islam, including Judaism and Buddhism. Um, and, uh, you know, there is nominally freedom of religion. It's dominated by the Orthodox Church. You can't really challenge the church. 
um, and especially since he came back to the presidency, he's used the church um, uh, to uh, um, institute new religious laws that you mentioned. And I think it's very powerful for people. You know, Pussy Riot was a great protest act during the election. They were inspired by the fraud in the election, um, and they were rising up against it. But it really hurt the cause of people who were against the uh, against Putin's state uh, because of believers, even people like Alexei Navalny, who was an opposition leader, a very prominent one, a very courageous guy. He was like, I'm not sure I agree with what they were doing. And so in a way, it sort of used the church to divide the opposition as well because no one wants to challenge the institution. One of the things I thought was interesting in the book that I didn't know about towards the uh, last couple chapters is Putin gets divorced. And while a lot of kind of it's a little later than a midlife crisis, but a lot of guys get divorced and they do the Corvette and the cocaine and the young woman, and it's all, you know, particularly where they have essentially unlimited power and wealth for all intents and purposes, and he becomes more conservative and in some ways more traditional, more isolated, really a very different path than kind of the stereotype, you know, rich guy who's set free uh, path uh, that then fills into the, the story that you just told. You know, the divorce is actually a, a good example of sort of, I mean, it's not for me to question the man's faith. If he says he's a believer, we, we can take him at his word or not. But, the, uh, but, you know, the fact that he would divorce his wife, you know, suggests that he wears his faith a little bit loosely, um, as, as, frankly, many Russians do, you know. And, uh, um, but there's no question when he came back that, you know, he was presenting himself as a defender of, uh, these faiths and um, this sort of conservative values. Uh, the irony being, of course, he's defending family values as he divorces his wife on TV. <laughs> um, so, you know, you can... Right. Oh, Caroline? Nope. Caroline? Good evening. My name is Caroline Papa. I'm part Palestinian, part Russian, so I'm a true living, breathing manifestation of Russian-Arab relations. And that's precisely what my question is going to be about. Given how Putin is growing in popularity in the Middle East, particularly in Syria, it's not something that's completely out of the ordinary because we do value a macho male figure for power that, you know, someone that knows what he wants and gets what he wants through force, mainly. And my question is, do you see that Russia will actually further its <coughs> sphere of influence, as you called it, into the Middle East? And it's a little reminiscent of the Cold War in one way or another. Do you see it actually expanding its power to become more than just a quick intervention here and there, like Syria, to actually become, to create better cooperation and relationships with the Arab governments in the Middle East? Um, that's a great question. The, um, I, I would say up until the Syria intervention, uh, Russia was nowhere in the Middle East. And, and that, that may be overstating things a little bit because they're obviously, military and intelligence relationships with Syria in particular that go way back um, to the 60s. Um, but I remember, you know, if you think of the Middle East peace processes that have evolved over the last couple of decades, like in many areas, Russia really wasn't a player anymore. You know, despite its seat at the UN, um, uh, it, 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 I remember at one point Putin announced that he was going to uh, invite all the <coughs> Middle East partners to uh, Moscow for a peace summit. Uh, to have negotiations, only he hadn't told the Israelis. Um, and so he had to then fly to Israel, and then because he went to Israel, he had to go to Egypt. And it, so it was like really not thought out, and they sort of seemed like a little bit of the amateur hour um, in dealing with that. Though, of course, in the Soviet bureaucracy and the foreign ministry and in the intelligence services especially, there, there was a long, you know, relationship there. Um, but I think it had really suffered during that period when Russia was, you know, on its back or on its knees, as they say there, um, and, and f sort of flailing about uh, in dealing with its own crises. Uh, and so I think that partly you've seen with Putin um, now uh, feeling like the country's back on its feet again, feeling a little bit more aggressive. Militarily has, you know, modernized quite a bit. Um, the, the, intervention in Syria, I think, was very much an effort to reestablish Russia as a dominant player. Um, and this is, this is a very Syria is just such a tricky question um, for so many reasons. It's such a complicated mess right now. Um, but Russia's intervention has been very effective there. 
um, just in the last year because um, there was a, there was frankly kind of a vacuum. And um, I know from my reporting in, in Washington that there was a time last year when it, it seemed like uh, Assad's fall was pretty imminent. And the U.S. at the time, the administration, bet on being able to talk to the Russians and to trying to make it a soft landing when Assad fell and some way that they could negotiate what kind of new government would emerge um, from that. And they misread Putin's intentions, which was to intervene forcefully to make sure Assad did not fall. And, um, and he's done that and has, to a certain degree, stabilized the Assad government. Um, it hasn't completely changed the course of the war yet, and I don't think it will for a long time, but it, it was clearly a very um, assertive effort on the part of Putin to um, to prop up what he saw as a uh, an important state in the in the fight against terrorism. Steve, in the U.S., we talk a lot about Vietnam syndrome and how that led to a withdrawal of U.S. kind of active the active mil use of military force to pursue foreign policy objectives for a long time. Is this kind of the end of the Afghanistan syndrome? Do you think, uh, or is that just a separate issue? No, I mean, I, th I think that's a good way to think about it because, you know, it, obviously there, there, you know, I mean, our humiliation in Vietnam uh, militarily had all kinds of consequences, but for the country kind of did all right, actually. You know, kind of we emerged from the Vietnam War and kind of had a great prosperous era and, um, you know, are where we are now, whereas the, the war in Afghanistan, I think, really contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union and a period of great disarray. So it's not an exact analogy, but I think that the idea of being able to project power again um, by the annexation of Crimea, um, really it started with the war in Georgia, uh, which was a very short war. It lasted five days um, against the Georgian military. The Russian military actually did pretty poorly. Um, they lost six planes in the first few days of the conflict. but. Um, but that was treated like they had won World War II again. Uh, and I think that there was this notion that, you know, Russia is back again. And certainly with Crimea, which was wildly popular inside Russia, um, and the intervention in, in Syria is, you know, broadcast on TV much the same way the Persian Gulf War was here. And, and you know, where we heard the, first heard this, you know, we've beaten the, uh, the Vietnam syndrome. So I think that there's an element of that, and it's very powerful in, in Putin's uh, political uh, message. I think of Grenada. I mean, I think of uh, Georgia as Grenada. Yeah, US that invention. would be a good both, both went badly, and yet both were heralded yeah, yeah. as kind of an end. Um, great. Uh, George Anthony, Penn State retiree. Um, Clinton's decision to expand NATO into Eastern Europe, uh, Kenan had cautioned against that. Many other thoughtful people thought that was unwise. Do you think that's a significant context for understanding Putin's policies, especially with respect to Ukraine? Um, yeah, I think I think it's vital to understand that um, that Russia views the expansion of NATO as a continuation of the Cold War, or even worse, the sort of triumphalism of the West after the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, that said, I was just debating this with somebody in Washington the other day about. Um, you know, what promises were made and whether or not you could, I mean, people will argue about NATO expansion, and I admit that there, there's an argument there, um, but people in uh, Poland, in Hungary, Czech Republic, the Baltic states, very much wanted to join NATO uh, because they saw it as a organization committed to a sort of collective security of Europe. And you can make a case, I think, quite convincingly that it's done that. Uh, and has been, by and large, a you know force of stability in Europe, the same way the European Union is. Russia, though, views it as an expansion of a hostile alliance uh, up to its borders, and you know that's been just a fundamental disagreement. The the one point that I often make to people who say, well, NATO expansion is the reason Russia is acting badly, is that you know when they when Clinton first expanded NATO. Uh, he did that, by the way, under pressure from Republican, uh, the Republican base. And it was a political decision, I think, certainly, domestically in the U.S., but uh, aside from the security issues. Um, you know, they, w they really made an effort to try to persuade the Russians that it was not aimed at the Russians. And by and large, NATO expansion wasn't until 2014. 
with the annexation of Crimea. Because even if you just look at the troop movements, I mean, we took 100,000 troops out of Germany. So if we were expanding you know, NATO to keep Russia down, why were we taking our troops out? Um, and, so, and then we also created the Russia-NATO charter, uh, and, and we brought them into the alliance. Putin, when he first came to public prominence, even suggested Russia could one day join NATO. So it wasn't always the, the, the thorn in Russia's side that they portray it as now. And I think there, there could certainly have been areas where they cooperated better. I think a really decisive moment was when George Bush abrogated the ABM treaty and decided to put missile defenses in Europe. That really rattled the Russians even as much as NATO expansion did. Um, and I think the notion of expanding it to include Ukraine, for the reasons I talked about earlier, the importance of Ukraine to Russia, I think that crosses a red line for Russia. And, and we've seen the consequences of that. Um, but I personally don't think that NATO expansion was necessarily a bad thing or the cause of all of the tensions with the Russians. I mean, it's interesting that, that Putin could have responded um, by creating his own defense alliance similar to the Warsaw Pact, right? But what's he got? What's, what's he got? Belarus. Belarus. No, there was the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, there's the nice. there's a Eurasian Economic Union. They're still trying to stand up. Um, Putin very much thinks uh, in spheres of influence. It's Yalta all over again, and he thinks that there should be areas that are Russian that are on the other side. Um, you know, and this this really is it's a confounding uh, problem to deal with right now because for the uh, by and large since '91 both parties, you know, there's been a consensus that uh, Russia was going to be a partner or at least not an adversary um, in, in the new world order. Uh, you know, we wouldn't get along with them a lot and we'd have our differences, but by and large the idea was we would cooperate with Russia. And we had this Russia-NATO council, um, and it still exists today though it's kind of on ice, um, and where there could have been areas of cooperation, um, you could have cooperated perhaps more um, in the war on terror than we did uh, uh, after 9-11. After but nonetheless, there was cooperation that went on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not sure exactly, you know, how you, how, you, how you appease Putin on this question. Uh, because, you know, I don't, think it's, I don't think we have to give up our security alliances to make him feel more comfortable, um, especially when they're not threatening to him. Great. Please introduce yourself, ask your question. Hi, I'm John. I'm a student here at the law school. We're very, very happy to have you, and I can only ask one question, so please come back. Um, <laughs> my question does concern Belarus and the other regional partners that Russia has. Um, I mean, if not a Warsaw Pact or certainly not a NATO, um, President Putin does have a lot of relationships with other authoritarian or pro-Russian figures, notably President Lukashenko or the late President Karimov or any number of others, um, the former. You know, I think he, he looks for, um, ultimately, he looks for um, countries that will respect Russia's interests. Um, and, and frankly, it's not a very equal relationship, I think. Um, the, uh, speaking of the near neighbors now, the former Soviet state, you know, for a lot of years there's been talk of somehow integrating Belarus and Russia again. But whenever it came to it, it became clear that Belarus would be 10 more provinces inside Russia. And the Belarusians, even Lukashenko, who's, you know, basically a Soviet man, um, they don't want that. Um, you know, if you look at Ukraine, you have... respect that we pay to our allies than Putin does to his. So it's interesting when they annex Crimea, Belarus would not recognize it um, as, as Russian territory. It still hasn't. 
Um, Kazakhstan didn't either. And Kazakhstan look at, looks at its region with a lot of Russian speakers, uh, ethnic Russians in it. Uh, and I think they're very wary uh, of, um, you know, a Russian intervention there. Um, you know, with Nazarbayev, I think that they have a very close relationship, and so there wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't be a move, a Russian move on it. Um, but I worried when Karimov died, like if instability um, sweeps at Uzbekistan, who's going to step in? We're not. So it would be natural that the Russians would and would maintain. It's interesting that Putin, on his way back from Asia, stopped there to pay his respects at the grave. And so, um, you know, I think that, you know, he's very interested in keeping these former Soviet states in an alliance with him and with them, uh, China, uh, as well. And, uh, you know, they're looking to Iran, though I think that's always going to be a very uneasy alliance uh, for a lot of historical reasons. Um, you know, they, Putin's looking for influence wherever he can buy it, essentially. Um, and, you know, I think it remains to be seen, like, what kind of block he could form because, you know, it's interesting the way he looks at the Chinese is that the, the Russia and China can gang up on the U.S. That's how he thinks of it. You know, they'll form an alliance and there won't be a superpower running the world anymore because these other two superpowers will block them. And uh, when we sanctioned a lot of the Russian energy companies, he immediately went to China to sign a deal um, with the Chinese about a new pipeline, um, a gas pipeline to China and, you know, talked about paying in rubles and all this. And the Chinese are like, thank you very much, we'll have dollars. Um, and the Chinese are very pragmatic. And I think that they, when they look at the world, the Chinese, they're like, yeah, we'll work with the Russians. You know, they like the resources and the economic opportunities there. But they also understand that their bigger trading partner is the United States. And so they're not going to look, I don't think, for a war with the United States. They're going to manage their relations with the U.S and in a way are doing a lot better than the Russians have been. So I think that Putin's dream, if he has one, of creating some sort of new alliance, some new Warsaw Pact, is still in its formative years. It'd be a polite way to put it. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Jocelyn. I'm a part of the law school here. Um, so I kind of wanted to frame Putin in a more uh, historical context in that uh, Russia as a state has really been built upon this idea of the cult of personality of a leader. Um, you saw that with uh, Lenin and Stalin and subsequent leaders uh, to the fall of the Soviet Union. And then as the, the Russian Federation tried to pull themselves out of the fall of the Soviet Union, you have Putin rise to the top and establish once again this kind of idea of uh, cult of personality. Do you believe that Russia needs that strong man, that person that uh, in, in your book you wrote about how he believes he's the person standing in between chaos and order? Uh, do you believe that the Russian state, in order to function within this world and this new world order, needs that strong man? And how, if so, is that different than any of the previous leaders of Russia in the past? Uh, you've done your homework. That's a, that's an. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better, really. The, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in like democratic values, right? So I think that there could have been a democratic system in Russia. I don't think it was inevitable. Um, because in, then you would have to get into the arguments of, well, like the Russian people are somehow genetically or socially wired differently than we are. And I just refuse to believe that. Um, and there are a lot of Russians who went out into the streets in 91, they went out in 93, they were out in 2011, you know, advocating for democracy or, or at least some say in their governance. Um, that said, I think you're right that there's always been this sense that um, Russia is such a chaotic system, it's such a compromised system because of the, um, the, the way that people have had to essentially live lies in order to uh, endure, you know, what was was a more authoritarian system in the Soviet times or even in Tsarist times, um, and so that relationship with the between the ruler and the and the ruled has always been a kind of transaction, um, and that you know the respect is always paid to the top leader. Um, you know, I think Yeltsin, to his credit, challenged that a bit because you know he was an absolutely flawed guy. He was almost certainly corrupt, um, and the um, people around him certainly were. And the, um, you know, but he allowed there to be a kind of 
democratic exchange of ideas. When I first got to Russia, you could actually go to the Duma and hear them debating bills. I mean, they would, they would have fights over things. Abortion, I covered an abortion story, like how do they regulate abortion in Russia, where it's very common. Um, how do they like process land um, sales, you know, that, which were still at that point prohibited. And, you know, so there was an, an exchange. And, and yet they sort of fell back to it. So the question is, was it inevitable? Or is that the system of governance that the people in power understand? Uh, and Putin being very much a creature of, you know, a law-abiding, order-following kind of Soviet man. Um, that's the system he understands. And once he had the power, you know, uh, he, he asserted it in the name of fighting off this chaos, uh, and then it just becomes inevitable again. There really isn't as much of a cult of personality as there was it, certainly in, in Stalin or Lenin's time, um, and Putin resists it somewhat, though less and less you find now. Um, but I, I don't think it has to be that way, no. Great. question was answered by the previous question. Because um, when you were using this term of Western democratic uh, system, because I'm oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Zoha from Iran. And because uh, in that perspective, we hear a lot this term Western democratic system. So it was always this question in my mind that if we say that democratic system is something like which bring human right for everyone, and if we say that human right is for everyone and all the time. So why do we put that Western part? So is it like we always want to um, make everybody like Western countries? And is this like, so in this way, we are not uh, considering the difference between people? Because although you said that you don't agree with the fact that Russians are, for example, different from Americans, but I mean, I myself, I'm one of those people that I really believe in differences between different societies and cultures and those things. So in one part of your speech, you said that many Russians, they are happy. I mean, they like someone like Putin because he gives them the sense of, I mean, like power, like the way Russians are. So it can be said that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know anything about uh, Russia, but does it mean that majority of people are happy with the system? And if so, can we say that if we take that out, like what happened in Iraq, or like when Gaddafi left the country, now the system, I mean, they wanted to bring the democratic system the way the Western countries are. So is it the system better now? So if we take Putin out of Russia, will the system work better if we just put somebody who is exactly according to those terms of Western democratic system? Can we ensure that that will work in the context of Russia, as you know, because that's my question. So um, you, you're right about the bias of Western. Um, and it's a Cold War term. And, um, and you know, there was a time, I thought, in the 90s where we could stop saying it. Um, and, you know, it, it is uh, perhaps my bias, but, you know, the, the experience of Western European democracies and with that then the United States, um, you know, is where the term comes from. So that is a model, uh, rightly or wrongly. Is it universal? No, I don't think that anybody is arguing that, um, that every country should be like the American system or the Portuguese system uh, or the British system or France. They're all different in some ways, right? Um, but I think the, the, the broader idea and you're right, I probably shouldn't say Western. I should just say the broader idea of a democratic system. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is a little bit more complicated, because when we say democratic and we think of like elections and you know how we structure systems, I, I, I use it also in a small d sense. And this gets to your question about are Russians happy? Because what, what democracy in my mind means is that I have, me personally, I have some agency in my governance, right? And uh, you know, everybody says every vote matters. I live in DC, my vote does not matter. <laughs> um, but, but if I have a problem in my neighborhood, right? If my street has a pothole in it, if there's a lot of crime, I know I can call somebody. 
I can call a police officer and say, hey, there's, there's you know, crime going on. I know that I can call my councilman and say, you know what, you know, our school's a mess. And then I'll call my board member. And I can then write, I mean, I happen to be a journalist, but I could write a letter to, I wouldn't ever abuse my position. But, the, uh, but you know, you can go to your local newspaper and you can complain. And you can go to, you can make a comp uh, campaign contribution and, and buy influence that way. Uh, whatever you want to do, at least there's a way that you feel like, I think, and maybe anybody can disagree with me if they want, you feel like here in this country and in others, in European countries that I know, in Iraq, by the way, where I spent a lot of time, people felt like, hey, I now have a voice. You know, and, and that's what I mean by democracy. And, and I know a lot of Russians who do not have that. And they don't feel like anything matters, their vote doesn't matter, uh, they can't call anybody, if they get stopped by the police, they get shaken down for a bribe, um, they don't trust anybody to do anything for them. If you call the fire department, they might come, but probably not, you know, and not if it's not a major emergency. And that's what I mean by democracy. And I know, and almost without fail, no Russian is happy in that sense um, of, of that kind of democratic experience. Um, that said, what you said is true, is that they've, they understand that the system is like that, but they like to feel pride in their country. And I think what, where Putin's success has been, uh, going back to what I said at the very beginning, it's, it's surprising, is he gives them something that makes them value being a citizen of a country where they have no voice, you know? And people, you know, again, I spent more time in Iraq, so I know it better, uh, and, and in Russia, obviously. But the, you know, nobody felt like, you know, they, nobody loved Saddam Hussein. Uh, even people on his side who were well taken care of, no one did. I mean, it was a brutal regime. Uh, no one liked the Soviet Union, and Putin will tell you that, um, that, you know, it was, it was an oppressive place. And, um, and uh, amazingly, um, I think Putin is falling into the thing that he used to criticize um, uh, when he uh, was young, you know, and he said the Soviet Union became ossified, they no longer responsive to people, um, but, you know, they gave them, you know, the victory over the Nazis, they gave them a man in space, you know, uh, forward, you know, that was their motto, and that was ultimately not enough for the people. And I think that you're creating a very similar situation now in Russia. I thought one of the more, really, most interesting parts of the book was this early on uh, political aspect of Putin, where he's, he's doing in St. But St. Petersburg, right? Retail politics. Look, he's fixing the potholes, you know, and he's doing that. And, and for the School of International Affairs students who participate then in that and in, say an internship, they find it a transformative experience that they're making a difference that they can. Government can have a direct impact on a particular I individual. Your pothole gets fixed. I made that happen. And it, it really energizes them, and it sticks with them, and it really uh, tends to guide the career choices and the values that they've made from even just one internship a couple months over summer as an SIA student. Putin didn't have that transformative experience, or if he did, it was outweighed by his concerns about the mess, about the spheres of influence, about the uh, institutions and, and uh, how they can be influenced by, by people that he thought were a threat to the state. Didn't stick as much. Hi, my name is Scott. Um, I live here in State College and I've been a digital subscriber to the New York Times for a number of years now. Thank so you very much. <laughs> come here. I wanted to ask you about something I saw in the newspaper today, actually. Um, they said that Secretary of Defense Carter had said that uh, Vladimir Putin was demonstrating a clear ambition to erode international order and warning him to stay out of um, U.S. elections or other democratic processes. Um, it reminded me of an op-ed that I'd seen in the New York Times maybe a month ago from an uh, associate professor at Princeton saying that she thought that election voting machines in certain states that didn't have paper backups were quite vulnerable to hacking. And I was wondering if you thought that even though Russia has shown a willingness to do misinformation campaigns using the internet and other means, whether you thought they might be willing to attack more of an infrastructure target like our voting machines. Um, 
Well, I can tell you that the intelligence agencies um, believe that the Russians were behind the hacks of the DNC. Um, and there's been suspicion of uh, hacks of two states, Arizona and one, um, that they seem to believe came from the same source as the DNC hack, um, which they've traced to the military intelligence unit and the foreign intelligence agency in Russia. Um, so that suggests, and people, I assume that's what Carter was referring to today, um, uh, believe that there is an active Russian campaign to, um, what's the word? Uh, I try to think of a polite word for it, to, to fool around with our election process. And the, um, I, a lot of people have sort of immediately when that DNC hack came up, uh, were like, oh, they're siding with Trump. Um, because Trump said very favorable things about about uh, Putin, um, but I, I think that you know, and again, there are limits to what I know at this point. Um, but I, I don't think that Putin's interest is taking sides in the American election. Um, I, I know he hates Hillary Clinton, um, and he he doesn't know Donald Trump, but he probably thinks Trump would be a little bit more favorable. Um, they used to distrust Republicans more um, than than Democrats because they always thought. Republicans would be harsher uh, towards Russia. Uh, that's, that's reversed now. So, um, but I think that, that there is an interest in the part of the Russians, and this goes back to the great trolling question, that there is an interest in, in kind of discrediting our process. Um, and to the degree that you can say, and Putin has said this, um, whenever you would criticize a Russian election, he would say, what about those hanging chads uh, in Florida, you know? And, uh, you know, how do you answer that, you know? And uh, they call that whataboutism, you know? And, the, um, and so I think that there's, a, there's clearly an effort on the part, whether it's sanctioned by the Kremlin or just nefarious, they call them active measures of the intelligence agencies uh, to just discredit the U.S. And, uh, and they're not, it's not just us, they're doing it in Europe. Uh, they're supporting, uh, they've supported Brexit, for example, because that undermined the EU. They're supporting right-wing parties like uh, M Marina Le Pen in France uh, and the one in Hungary. And so there seems to be, a, they, they've, much like the Russian military, uh, they seem to have their, um, their wind back, you know, and they, they, uh, they're, they're strutting around a little bit more than, than they had for a couple of decades. Uh, and I think that you're seeing the consequences of that now um, in, in this cyber world uh, where things are very hard to trace, you know. I mean, there, there was an attack in Estonia, which is called the first cyber attack. Um, it was in 2007 when they shut down a lot of Estonian sites over a dispute, strangely enough, over a monument, uh, a World War II monument. Um, and there was a, apparently a hack on the Ukraine, one of the Ukrainian systems. Um, related to the Russians. So they seem to be very busy in this sphere. And I wouldn't be surprised at all to see a lot more on this in the next couple of months. Thanks. So we have time for uh, two more quick questions. So we'll go one and then two over back to this side. Maybe we can do three because since he's standing. All right, we'll do three, but you got to be quick. <laughs> got got right. really to what I was going to ask. But Thanks, um, I just want to, I guess, go to the other side then. I'm Chris Beam from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. Um, what, what then would you say, or do you have any insight into what's going on in the Trump campaign with respect to Russia? I mean, there was, you know, is it simply just a matter of Trump liking the fact that Putin said something nice about him, that his former campaign manager seemed to have some, have some pretty clear um, involvement with Russia and not particularly good ones, benign ones? And so I'm just wondering, do you have any insight into that? Um, it's, I mean, uh, to try to be brief, uh, Trump has no relationship with Putin. And he talked for a long time like he did, and which was very strange. He talked about, oh, we got to know each other. Yeah. And um, uh, I'll tell you a quick story, because Putin every year gives a, a press conference. And one of the guys who was a former intern in the bureau uh, when I was in Moscow working for us, um, a young reporter, very, very clever, smart young reporter, uh, now works for ABC News. Um, and he had gone to the press conference, and it, it, these things go on for hours. People ask lots of, of, of questions, and it was really boring. 
I mean, for me it was fascinating, but for the like, ABC News correspondent in, uh, in Moscow, he was not going to get on air with Vladimir Putin. And so after this uh, press conference ends, Putin, like up here, he has a little dais, and then he, he sort of has a scrum afterwards where reporters come and throw questions at him. And this reporter, being a very clever, well-trained at the New York Times Moscow Bureau, <laughs> shouts out a question to Vladimir Putin, what do you think of Donald Trump? He says you're great. Um, words to that effect. And, and, and Putin, kind of off the cuff, clearly unprepared for the question, um, gave this remark like, well, he's a very yarky guy, which means like colorful, uh, it can mean brilliant, also flamboyant. Next thing you know, Trump's like, he called me a genius. And, um, <laughs> and it, as near as I can tell, that's the extent of their interaction together. Um, uh, that, that said, the, Paul Manafort, the campaign director, who's now, he's now quit after it turns out he's taken a lot of money from Ukrainians off the books, um, and some of the other people on the Trump um, uh, campaign are actually a, a category of people, I'm going to be a very apolitical here, who, who work with Russia. Um, and a lot of big businesses love to do work with Russia. Uh, Exxon just had to pull out of a big deal in the Arctic um, because of the sanctions. Uh, Carter Page is a guy who worked for Gazprom for a while. Uh, very, you know, reasonable guy who looks at Russia as a place where we should be doing business rather than having these fights over Ukraine and stuff. So ideologically, or maybe like from their business orientation, they see Russia differently than I would say the national security consensus in Washington does, which is they're looking at it in terms of you know, the, the international order, the annexation of Crimea, human rights, um, you know, the war in Syria and so forth. Um, but they just look at Russia differently. And I think the people around Trump, including Trump himself, um, from his experience hosting this universe pageant there in 2013, he liked Russia. And, you know, I liked Russia when I went. And there are people who like, you know, like Russia and they want to do business with it. And, you know, that's, that's a legitimate point of view, I think, to have. And that we should be debating that rather than how colorful, um, you know, uh, Putin thinks Donald Trump is. So. Okay, so if you two would like to maybe together ask your questions real quickly and then we'll combine them and then you'll go and that'll try to keep us somewhat on time because I like to keep on uh, time. My name is Qi from China. Uh, I'm definitely very interested about uh, Russia and uh, Putin, but today uh, my question is not about uh, Russia and Putin. Uh, my, I, my question is, uh, very general, like, uh, is it a reporter a dangerous, a dangerous job, uh, uh, you know, because uh, especially you, you, you tend to report uh, uh, national leaders like, uh, like uh, Putin. What if you report bad news about these leaders? So uh, will you get uh, uh, ravage or something? And, uh, and uh, how about, uh, uh, New York Times, how they protect uh, uh, these uh, reporters, especially they are international reporters. Uh, what they think about, uh, uh, consider about this, uh, this news, uh, if they did the perfect research and they believe what they want to report, they will consider. Uh, what if they piss some national leaders, they will they, they don't get a visa to into another country. Okay, and if you'd ask your question, please. Hi, how are you? I'm Aziz, uh, I'm Egyptian, I'm an energy engineer. I'm sorry, first of all, for being, for coming with the gym shorts. Uh, um, I have two small questions. The first one, yeah, I think. One. one question, two questions, blend it into one. No, one. <laughs> um, There's an art to this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the attacks, I'm going to uh, talk about again about the, the hacking, uh, the electronic attacks that was, do you think that they were led by Edward Snowden that uh, now is seeking a, who's, who is in Russia right now and maybe Julian Assange who, are, who have a really close relationship with each other? And second question, do you think that Erdogan, uh, what, what is the relationship, what are the relationship dynamics between Erdogan, especially after the coup and, and Putin? Um, after all, uh, uh, Turkey has a, has a U.S. military base in, uh, in Turkey that is going and attacking uh, the Russian, uh, uh, the Russian the Assad regime. At the same time, we saw two days ago that in the G20 summit, 
um, Putin uh, shaking hands with Erdogan. So what, what I, I don't get the relationship between Erdogan and Putin, especially with the NATO and the United States. Thank you. Um, the, the, I can actually answer these somewhat related if I understand the first question right, which is, you know, in places like Turkey, it's very difficult uh, to report. And um, we've faced harassment there, um, especially our Turkish uh, colleagues um, who help out. You know, in every bureau, um, we have local staff, you know, who help with the language and, and, uh, and just reporting and all that. And we've come under incredible pressure. And, um, the, the, you know, the New York Times has been kicked out of a lot of countries. I was kicked out of Belarus. Um, but the, but we, I think that the, the main thing that we have going for us is, is an, an international reputation um, on our good days of being fairly objective. And um, uh, I think that even when, I mean, the Russians really hate the New York Times. And, and, and then yet Putin will write an op-ed for us, and he's done that a couple times uh, because I think they value it as a respected platform. And that's true with BBC. Uh, they, Putin just gave a big interview with Bloomberg. Um, and so I, th I think they, even as they loathe us for being honest uh, and sort of unvarnished in our reporting, um, they, they respect that, for the most part, um, that we're doing it fairly. Um, but in a lot of countries, in China, uh, we faced a lot of, of issues with the government. Uh, we publish a site in Chinese, by the way, and that's been blocked um, because they don't like our style of journalism, if you will. Um, and, you know, I think that we just have to keep doing what we can to inform, you know, our readers, uh, certainly, but in, increasingly an in international audience um, by being fair and objective as best we can, you know. And, uh, you know, I haven't been thrown out of Russia yet, even after the book, so um, maybe I won't be able to go back. But, the, um, uh, but you know, I think that that's, that's, that's how you can deal with it. But, you know, frankly, it's difficult at times in a lot of different places. Um, uh, the relationship with Erdogan is, is fascinating, and I can't give you an answer, because six months ago I would have told you a totally different one, and um, the, it was extremely strained um, uh, ahead of, I mean, you know, Turkey is a NATO ally, so it's, it's, it's caught up in Russian loathing for that, and, and yet there was a time, like some of the Trump people, where they were doing a lot of business with Turkey. And then, because of the intervention in Syria, there was a, a huge uh, amount of tension that led to the Turks shooting down uh, a Russian plane that violated their airspace after repeated warnings. Um, and talking about, uh, to broaden this to the NATO alliance generally, it's interesting the way Putin reacted to that, because if he wants to attack a NATO plane, um, he's going to attack NATO, and that's more than just one Turkish plane, and I think that applies in the Baltic states as well. And so, you know, he got very angry, and he huffed and puffed, and they banned Russians from going to Turkey, which was punishing the Russians more than the Turks, I think. <laughs> and, the, um, and, and there was, a, a, it seemed like, a few months of, you know, quite vigorous hostilities, even to the point where they were accusing Erdogan of being complicit personally or through his family connections in the trade with ISIS, oil trade with ISIS. And then a few months later, after the coup, uh, Turkey's relationship seemed to be strained with the West, with the US, and suddenly Putin and Erdogan are pals again. So, I mean, I think that reflects the sort of tactical aspect of what Putin's doing as much as an ideological one. Um, and, you know, frankly, is a kind of weakness because, you know, when you're fed, if, if you've all read Orwell, you know, the two-minute hate, that's what it felt like about the Turks for a while. I mean, they were really, like, the Russian media was vilifying Erdogan. And, and then suddenly, now we're friends again, and he's a hero, and he stood up against the, the coup that was backed by the, by the U.S. And, you know, I don't know how a Russian consumer of news can keep it straight, you know, but... Um, but it, I, I think we'll just have to see, you know. Professor Rogers. Uh, let me ask you all, please, to thank Scott and Steve for such an amazing uh, dialogue. Thank you.
let me also thank you all. Uh, I feel like we had this global tour in the space of an hour and a half uh, from also our own uh, residents of our community from all over uh, the planet. Uh, and I think I also already heard a Bring Steve Myers Back uh, committee being formed. So hope maybe after the election or the next uh, hack of the DNC emails or uh, the next uh, development in the Putin um, Trump bromance, uh, we can invite him back. Uh, but for now, I will invite you all, if you'd like, uh, to step outside. For those of you who'd like to purchase the book, it's for sale. And Steve will be here for another hour to sign them for you. So thank you again for coming.